Jamal, who had been living in Los Angeles with his dad and grandmother, was ready to return to his family in the Pacific Northwest. And when he did, this 16-year-old basketball prodigy quickly made his game known on every court in Seattle. It was like when I got back up here, it was a switch, and, and something happened when I was 16, and my life was never the same after that. His name, it just spread, it spread. All you'd have to say is Jamal. You don't even have to say Jamal Crawford. You just say Jamal and everybody knows who you're talking about. He was gone from seventh and eighth grade, came back going into our junior year of high school, which is 96, 97. And he came back 6'5", and I was like, wow, this is unreal. I was playing everywhere. If there was a, a hoop and a run there, I was there. I would always go to Rainier Vista, uh, late night boys and girls club. And they had a, a men's league at the time, and I was able to play against grown men at that age. I had never seen him play since he was, you know, a little boy. So the talent that he had, I had no idea. And when I sat in that gym, he was like beyond the three-point line. And he shot and I grabbed my friend. I was like, what is he doing? And that is not about to go in. And it just went in. And I was like, no way. Jamal was a kid that wanted to show everybody what he can actually do on this court. Felt like he had a lot to prove. There was a hunger inside of him that he actually had to get out. And it was by playing the sport of basketball. We got Rainier Community Center at late night basketball. And this guy's like 6'4". And I mean, he's doing moves like a 5'9", 5'10 player. And he's just shooting the ball from almost half court, like a couple steps inside half court and knocking him down. And like fresh move after fresh move. So I'm like, this guy's really good. So everybody's like, yeah, that's Jamal Crawford, man. He's from here, but he moved away. I met Will when he saw me do a move. He's like, that has to be Jamal. Like, that's the guy I've been hearing about. I saw him as a little guy, but he played with a lot of heart and he was talented. I could see it, something in him, you know, and, and our friendship took off from there. And it was just me and him ever since. So we was playing 21, Eric's been 21. And somehow he ended up guarding me. At that point, Iverson was my favorite player. So I did a move like similar to Iverson, a crossover, and I got him with it and like shifted him away to the opposite side and he made the shot. He was like, man, how old are you? And I told him my age. He was like, man, you got game. So he kept watching me play during that process of that day. And by the end of the day, we exchanged phone numbers. He was like, man, you got game. Like, you know, we need to hang out. Like, you know, you can show me that. I want you to show me that move. And I was like, well, I want you to show me a couple of moves you were doing. When Jamal first came back, his sister Lori had contacted me and said that Jamal knew that I was coaching and wanted to come and play for me. We were missing that one piece, kind of like superstar player, but at, at most importantly, a point guard. So the year before, in 97, we had a talented team, just didn't have a, a point guard. So we knew once Jamal got on board and stuff, we knew that we had a great chance at winning the state championship, you know, my first state championship. I felt very confident about it. Jamal was even more confident than I was. Crawford, feeling it and dealing it. Oh, that I basically went a little beyond with Jamal as far as disciplining him and, you know, just, just because I just, you know, he was just a kid that, such a great kid, you want to make sure he made it and you didn't want to give him the wrong, wrong perception of what it was going to take to make it. You know, you got so many coaches out there that'll coddle these kids and pat them on their butts and stuff and I wasn't going to do that with him because I knew he had a chance to make it so I knew I had to be a little bit harder on him. A lot of people will think that, oh man, he let Jamal do what he wanted, but Jamal will be the first to tell you I was a lot harder on him than I was on, on most of the other players. He would yell at me just as quick as anybody else or quicker to get the message across. And he's always been a father figure. He always cares about his players off the court as well, more than anything. Jamal ended up here at Rainer Beach and when we actually got a chance to get him on the court and see him play, it was unbelievable. It was a brand new style of basketball that Seattle's actually never seen with a 6'5 guard that can handle the ball like it was a yo-yo. I'm from the whole other side of the city. I went to Rainer Beach because Jamal, when me and him got close that summer, he begged me to go to Rainer Beach. He's like, yo, Bay Varsity as a freshman. Dude, come over here. I'll make sure you'll be on the varsity team. So I convinced my mom, like, oh, that's where I want to go. I want to go to Rainer Beach. Our games from gym to gym, unbelievable. They wanted to see this kid that they said had abilities that were NBA-like in high school. We would go in places, certain gyms. There would be some of the Sonic players there, 
but kids and stuff would run up to him before the Sonic player. That's how big he was out here. To be honest with you, he might have been the most popular player in Seattle next to Gary Payton and Sean Kemp because everybody wanted to go see this phenom playing for Rainier Beach, and so the stands were packed. Watching him in high school was a big thing in Seattle. Jamal Crawford was a big name around. A kid that can score. He was playing uh, amongst little kids. We would always hear about him and hear about how many numbers he would put up, and we just start going to basketball games. When I was 16, things really took off because now people are like, okay, he has pro potential. And a lot of the pros, Gary Payton, Doug Christie, Sean Kemp, all those guys kind of took me under their wing. It made it a lot more realistic to me because I could reach out and touch those guys and ask them questions about the NBA or whatever, whatever questions I had. And they saw something in me. And from there, I was like, okay, everybody in this area kind of knew I was going to be in the NBA once I was 16. Gary kind of reached out to Jamal and showed him the ropes and what it was going to take in order to uh, get to that next level. And so he just, he just kind of like uh, mentored Jamal, looked out for Jamal, made sure that, you know, he was doing all the right things and stuff in order to make it. Well, when I was playing in Seattle, we heard of a young kid at Rainier Beach that was a phenomenal player. When I went to go see him play, I, I said, this kid is going to be really, really special. So uh, as soon as I seen him, I said, uh, you know, we're going to have to talk. I waited after the game, and, and then I introduced myself to him. It's in 96, I mean, Sonics went to the finals. You know, so Gary and Sean, these guys are super duper stars. Doug Christie was a bona fide pro, and he went to my high school. To have those guys and have those relationships, it kind of, it, it made my dream so realistic. I'm like, I can touch it, I can taste it, I can get it, you know, and it was so close. Because before, the pros seemed so far-fetched. Because, I mean, honestly, how many guys are going to the NBA? You know, and every kid all over the world now, it's a global game. It's not just the country have hoop dreams, you know, and the majority of the guys don't make it. Having the opportunity to pick their brains and knowing I was so close, it meant the world to me. It was just no fear. He had no fear. He knew he was going to make that shot. He went one on five and shot a floater and made the shot. And those rims of the kingdom were tight, so I don't know how he made that shot, man. That was unreal. He went one on five, and, and that was typical of his determination to, uh, to win that championship game. He was not going to let us lose.